Hey, John here, talking about adding a direct map cache for the uh, SD card on the Z80 Retro Project. So the other day I was tinkering around with the documentation that's part of the project, and I redrew the memory layout because I've decided to move the uh, low bank of the TPA from bank zero here over to bank 14, okay? And I updated a little coloring a little bit to hopefully drive home what goes where a little better than I did before. These white banks I'm gonna use for our cache slots. We're gonna put them in here along with any other data like the tag table. Now you might recall that the uh, yellow and the blue coloring used to be over here in bank zero. I just moved it over here to 14 and I added the labels here to say, by, by the way, the yellow part of bank 14 is the low half of the transient program area. We call that TPA. The blue part down here is the zero page, which includes various uh, values that are needed by CPM, like the vector that jumps into the BDOS, so we can call the OS routines, as well as the general purpose IO buffer that starts at address hex 80 when CPM and or the TPA are running, okay? The high part of the TPA is stored in bank 15. Each of these banks is 32K, the Z80 can access 64k at once so it can see both bank 14 and 15 at the same time provided that we choose bank 14 to appear in the low half and bank 15 is hardwired to appear in the high half of that 64k range okay so i added an arrow here to re remind us that this really is the same thing as the uh, uh bank 15 whenever the z80 accesses the high memory I added some curly braces to say, by the way, the operating system resides in this area here, which is comprised of the CCP, the BDOS, the BIOS, and the 16K region here, which is green or was entirely green before. Now it has these stair steps in here. This 16K here, starting at the load base address, is where the flash boot ROM reads the first 16K of the SD card partition into memory and then branches to this address. I've talked about that before. I put the stair steps in here to kind of remind us that, you know, when the TPA is running, it can consume memory all the way up to the CCP by default. It can even overwrite the CCP and even the BDOS and go all the way up here to EA00 in our current configuration if it wants to, provided it doesn't need the services that were uh, previously would have been part of this if it overwrites them. In theory, you could even overwrite the BIOS. You know, in some uh, system uh, utilities, you might actually decide to write uh, that uh, can do certain things without any uh, uh, support or assistance in any way uh, uh, from the CPM OS or the BIOS, and, and that's okay too. That's, that's certainly allowed. So these stair steps kind of remind us that that is the case. So. In general, I'm just bringing this up to speed of the current uh, state of the BIOS code. Uh, no changes to the SD card and the file system. And then I added a, a diagram down here that shows you how the direct map cache data variables or whatever, however you want to think about them, are all derived from the CPM track. So let's zoom in a little bit. Well, I guess bird's eye view first would be a good idea. Given a track number, and we talked about this before. From the track number directly, I guess you could say, right? This is a direct mapped cache. And by that, I mean that the slot number, for the most part, what that really means is that, that the cache slot number is directly determined by some number of bits in the thing that you're caching. In this case, it's, it's, it's a CPM track. So any given track number can be directly converted into a slot number by simply zeroing out the most significant eight bits of the track numbers. You can see bits I, J, K, L, M, N, P, and Q are simply used as they are, even in the same bit positions in this example, to represent the slot number. And the rest of these bits up here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H are just simply thrown away and replaced with all zeros, okay? In order to de determine our tag number, I talked about before, what we do is we take the most significant byte of the track number. We know these two bits are always zero, at least in our current implementation of our file system, because 
we know that CPM mandates in version 2 that all sector numbers start from zero and go all the way up to FFFF, which is all ones, 16-bit value. And because our file system is designed such that there are four sectors per track, we know then that the track numbers must go from 0000, zero, zero, zero on hex to 3FFF in hex, because that is one quarter of the total number of sectors and expressed in hex. So we don't even care what these two bits are, in other words, right? So the tag combined with the slot number, as you can clearly see, if you take the tag number and the slot number, you can smoosh them back together and you can reconstitute the track number directly from these values, all right? And you just simply set A and B to zero and that's what you get. All right. So what about the rest of the stuff going on in here? Given a slot number, I can directly convert that by taking these two bits, I and J, moving them over to an 8-bit value here and calling that my bank number. And by formatting it in this manner, what happens is it's already aligned and ready to go to be written directly into at least these four bits which can be directly written into the GPIO latch here of the Z80 retro board in these four bit positions right here. Bits, uh, output bits four through seven, okay? Now, as a reminder, if we're gonna ever diddle with these values here, we need to make sure we're not changing the values of these other four bits, because if we do, we might be messing around with the SD card or the printer or something like that. So. Uh, we'll see what we need to do is anytime we want to update the, um, the bank number, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, recall the 8-bit value that's currently stored on the output latch. We're going to keep these bits alone by playing some anding and oring and things like that. And then what we're going to do is result with what was in the low 4 bits combined with the bank number in the high 4 bits. And in this scenario, we're only going to be dealing with four banks to hold our slots because we've got 256 total slots with 64 in each of these banks. Therefore, we know the top two bits of our bank number will always be 0 and 0. So this will represent banks number 0, 1, 2, and 3 to hold all of our slots. And as I said before, the tag table has to go somewhere. We're going to store that in bank number D or number 13 right next to the um, the uh, low bank over here. So you're gonna see bank 15 with the high part. We're gonna see bank 14 holding low RAM when the CPM code is running. And when we're in the BIOS and we're diddling with our, our cache for the SD card, we're gonna see bank 13 will be used to hold the tag table and the other banks can be used for slots. Now, given our slot number over here. Anytime this slot has been selected, we can directly then access the data in that slot by going back to our slot number and grabbing these bits here, shifting them to this position right here, zeroing out all the other bits, and we end up with the actual RAM address within this bank over here of the uh, first byte of the slot. Okay, so this dry diagram here is the pictorial uh, representation of some of the routines we looked at last time and some other routines we're going to look at uh, this time as well. All right, so what we're doing here is we're, we, I've already factored out the read and write routine logic from our retro BIOS and I have. Uh, what am I doing in here? I, I set the debugging in here to one. What else do I got going on here? I've got um, I've got some debugging code that we're going to see in a minute. I, I've stuck a wedge into the console input routine right here. Okay, see this right here? I put this in here. The idea is, you know, we turn on all this debugging. It's so noisy we can't see what's going on. So what I've done is I've hijack this for a minute. This is called a wedge usually or something like that. 
rather than just going and executing the usual character uh, input routine, like I talked about before, I'm going to do this instead. I'm going to call the input routine. I'm going to ask, did I get an escape key? Because you don't really use the escape key hardly at all in CPM, or at least while we're debugging this BIOS, I don't care. If I hit the escape key, what I'll do is it will say, okay, call the rwdebug wedge routine. Otherwise, it'll just go on its merry way and return the escape key or whatever key I pressed to CPM for normal processing as it would normally go. So anytime you're reading a character for any reason, if I press escape, a debug routine is going to call, get called. When it's done, it'll go ahead and send the escape key anyway back to the, uh, the caller that was waiting for a keystroke. Arguably, I probably should jump back up here and get another character because we're going to be sending garbage escape characters all the time to our, our, our code. But it doesn't really matter right now. This is just a debug hack to allow us to, uh, to call a routine on demand when we press a magic key. Now, oh, in the direct map cache logic, since last time, since last time, I've added some documentation in here. Mostly this is a narrative of what I talked about when I was designing some handler routines that convert track numbers to uh, slot numbers and things like that. So I can see these broken out, mostly because I drew them all out by hand on, on the green bar. It's in the video, but it would be nice to see it in text in here. And also I have the uh, a pictorial representation uh, in here as well. So you've got both of these forms available to you. And what did I do down here? I added a couple of more labels. Uh, right now I got the debugging turn up on the Mac, so it's going to be very noisy when it goes. I have to define which bank is going to hold my tag table. Right? And as I said, I'm going to put that in bank number D, decimal 13. And I want to know and document that the tag table must start at address zero in that bank. Now, I use this notation for myself. This is a label. I could have defined the label, but I'm not going to use the label anywhere. It's commented out to let you know, let me know, really, that the base address of the tag table is zero. It must be zero. You cannot change this, which to me would be indicated if I remove this comment. Oh, it makes sense that I could change the value in here. No, you can't, all right? It must be zero or the code will not work. And the reason for that is because I ignore this and assume that it is zero in the way that I've implemented the code below. So it's documented. And it is set up with my own notation, plus the wording here, it must start at zero or all bets are off. Okay, that's why it's done that way. I've got a bit here, and the most significant bit, uh, this is a mask that I can use when I access the values from the tag table. If the most significant bit is on, then the tag is invalid. And when it's zero, it is valid. All right, so I called it invalid. That's the invalid bit, right? I prefer to name my variables such that they always mean, uh, you know, true. When they're true, this word makes sense. If I called it valid, and when it was true, it turned out to be invalid, that doesn't make sense. It's incredibly annoying when people do that. It's rampant in lots of coding. It's, I, I hate it. Just don't do that. If you want to modify my code, that's great, but don't submit a bunch of garbage back in here where you say things like, this is the valid bit, and when you set it to true, it's invalid. No, that would be called an invalid bit, okay? So I try to be consistent about this. Not always 100% uh, easy to do because if you're writing a driver or something for some device whose documentation is bass act words and you might want to at least match their words so that you match the doc so this is a never-ending battle just fyi if i invent it and i invent its use <laughs> and it doesn't get impacted by anything externally i'll tend to use words that mean what they say instead of the opposite of what they say uh what's going on down here here's another mask value for the track bits it's a 3f as you can see in the tag table, 
which comes directly from these bits out of the track number, right? We talked about that before. These bits are, if they're all set to one, you'd have a 3F. So I take the tag out of here and I ended it with the tag mask 3F. What it would do is it would turn these bits off or make uh, or ignore them. Okay, so there's times when I need to be able to take this, guarantee that these bits are zero, and so on, right? So that's what that could be used for in the code below. Talked about this before, the SD card memory map, uh, the partition, I should say, must start at hex 800 in terms of its block numbers, and that's in the diagram right here. It must This must be 800 when you partition your SD card. That's true because... This value is used in the code below, and I don't have a um, set of logic to recalculate that. I've talked about that before. Someday I'll fix that, but for now that has to be hard-coded, and don't mess with it too much. Uh, I talked about these before. Given a track number, how do I get the uh, slot number? Well, we've got track number in HL. The slot number is simply throw the H away, right? That's in this diagram right here. Here's the track number. I want a slot number, just set these bits to zero, and I'm done. This is why it's a direct map cache. That's the, this is the whole reason that happens, okay? How do I get the bank number from the slot number? This code here does what happens if I'm given this. Take these two bits out and stick them over here. That's what this guy does. How do I calculate the slot address, given the, or the, the, the address of the slot in the bank? that's given by calling this routine up here, I call this. Talked about that last time as well. That takes these bits here and moves them into this position to calculate the value there. So I can figure out where in the bank selected here, I can find the slot number that's given in the HL register pair. And I note that, by the way, H will always be zero in this current design because we only have 256 slots numbered 0 through FF. Therefore, we know that if I set HL equal to the slot address, the slot number, then H will always be 0, and it's shown in the diagram there. Now, here's two new routines that I wrote and a little trouble debugging. So uh, I, will le I left this in here. If you want to play around with it, you can turn this on, and you can see what's going on uh, without having to retype all this junk in and hex dump out the entire uh, tag table and the, and the slots to see if everything's okay. This is incredibly noisy, so it's commented out. Uh, let's look and see how this thing works. First of all, let's see what I say about it, right? Give me the cache tag given a slot number. So if I got a track, I call the upper routines that says convert the, the, the track into a slot. Slot number, I should say, right? Then I can t pass that value into here, and I can get the tag from the tag table, right? So given a track, I can convert it into the slot number here. Then I can say, given this slot number, call the routine we're just about to walk through, and it will use the slot number to look up the tag value in this table. And the interesting thing here is that the table is not stored anywhere in memory that we can just get to, because it's not in either of these two banks. <laughs> Therefore, I have to enable a different bank over here, which is, like I said, that's bank number D or number 13 in decimal. That's where the tag table will be located. And as I said, the tag table must start at address zero in this current design. So what we're going to see in the code then is I've got to switch the bank to bank number D. And then down here, I'm going to go get the tag value out of the out of the tag table and I'm going to return it in the accumulator down here. Okay? So there's a there's, there's two things you need to be uh, aware of in here. Number 1, I throw this warning in to you and myself. If you're going to use interrupt handlers and the stack is anywhere near the low uh part of memory or if you're going to use interrupt handlers and the interrupt handler cares about and or alters the GPIO output port, this routine, you have to be incredibly careful about how you write it. All right. I would argue if you really want to do that, what you really, uh, day one, just disable interrupts right up here as you enter in this routine and re enable them right down here 
right before you return from this routine. That way, what happens is the GPIO output value, right, that's altered up here and is restored down below, will have been therefore restored before an interrupt could come along and get confused if an interrupt had, uh, happened to be called in here after we're playing around with the uh, the bank numbers and stuff like that and might have it set to a bank that's not uh, number 14 where CPM would want it to be, okay? So I'm just saying, that's why the warning's in here. Eventually, we'll have to run into this when we play around with interrupts when we're uh, doing like a real-time clock or interrupt-driven uh, serial I.O. and stuff like that. So that'll make it very interesting at that time. Your first pass, trust me, just disable them when you're in this routine. I would have put the disable and the enable in this code. However, if you do that unnecessarily, now if you think about it, right now, I have yet to ever enable interrupts while we're running anything in CPM. My current BIOS doesn't ever use them for anything. They're never turned on. So it's okay to turn them off if they're already off, but if I blindly turn them back on down here, <laughs> then I will have turned them on and they're not configured to do anything. So if you're going to make changes like this, they have to be coordinated with everything else. Given the lack of need of interrupts, they're not in here at all, okay? I'm just saying, if you want to work ahead, beware. And I try to remember to warn uh, people against times when that would be an opportune moment to mess with interrupts. Uh, having said all that, uh, keep in mind that if you're going to actually use the SPI IO routines while talking to the SD card, which is the whole point of this routine anyway, this whole module, while we're talking to the SD card, you also have problems with interrupts if the interrupts are going to diddle around with your output port. Okay, that's going to be even worse uh, scenario to have to fix than this one. Be careful. Okay. That'll be a more advanced topic we'll talk about some other time. Hence that comment. <laughs> okay, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So moving on, what do we do? We go grab the uh, the cached value that tells us what the current output value uh, is on the in, on the GPIO output port, and we have to do this because the way the assembler gets confused. Um, this would have probably been a heck of a lot more obvious in retrospect to just hard code it and it with zero F. That's the whole point in here. What we want to do is retain the least significant four bits, as you recall, are the sprint strobe and the SD card value. And we want to zero these four bits out. Okay. Then what we want to do is take the bank number that we want to select and we want to or those bits into the accumulator at that point so that we have the low four bits that were in there before combined with the high four bits that's the tag bank which the value is d so we want d followed by don't change the low four bits okay then we want to output that into the port which will change the the low bank value while leaving the rest of the bits alone okay now, what about all this garbage? Why did I do this? Well, what I really wanted to do is I, I defined this variable here, the low uh, the GPIO out low bank in the IO library. Let's have a look see at that. All right, it's in the library directory next to this one. And what I've done is I say, look, I want a symbolic name that represents the four bits of the low bank portion of the output latch. So I want to address bits A15, 16, 17, 18, which you can see, as I showed you in the schematic, are the high four bits of the latch, which is symbolically are bits, you know, 10, 20, 40, and 80 in hex. So how do I do that? All I could just simply equate it to the or expression of these four bits. And I have a tendency to want to put them in parentheses. And this assembler gets upset because it thinks that that is the addressing mode uh, where you are, are going to reach into memory and grab a, a value just due to the, the grammar of the Z80 assembler. So what I'm going to do is or it with zero, which doesn't change it in any way, just to satisfy the simplistic parser of the Z80 assembler. So this expression here is F0. 
So how then am I using it? Well, the same foolishness happens in here. If I simply say and it with tilde GPIO out low bank, which is what I did the first time I wrote this, because that would have been nice and readable. Thank you very much. That would have been, you know, remember low bank is F0. Uh, what, I, what I need for this particular expression are all the bits that are not in the low bank set of bits. I want a 0F. And that's what tilde GPIO out low bank means to me. But to this simple assembler, what it does is because this is a uh, an equate to a constant, what happens is it thinks that it's a 16-bit value. So tilde F0 to the assembler is actually FF0F. And if I said and the implied accumulator, is not part of this instruction. You don't say A, it knows it's A, so you give it the value here. But if you give it a value that's FF0F, which this expression is to this assembler, then you get a warning and it gets upset because you're trying to end it with a 16-bit value in an 8-bit instruction. Okay, shut up the assembler. If I take that and then end that with this, then it guarantees all those other bits are zero and it is an 8-bit value. So this is, all best of intentions, completely screwed up, uh, but I'm going to leave it because uh, this sort of thing does happen, and you should probably understand it. Um, I'm just saying. Or maybe I should hide this whole ugly mess in another equate elsewhere so this is more readable. I don't know. Uh, let me know what your te favorite technique is in the comments below. I like to have the symbolic name in here and have it derived from what it really is and not have all these hard-coded, disembodied constants all over the place. So, mm, mm, sorry. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. When all that's done, I can OR it with the cash tag bank, which we saw before is equated to D0, and I end up with D followed by what was originally in the low order four bits, which is exactly what we want, and I can stick that into the latch, and we got what we want. Go on our merry way. So now that we have the right bank selected so we can see the data in our tag table, we can reach into the tag table and see what we want to get out of there, right? Which is uh, the tag itself for the given slot number, which is in the HL register pair before this routine here is called. So at this point in our code, HL equals the slot number. And as we know from this diagram over here, the slot number itself, because these are all zero, is exactly the address of where the tag is in the tag table because of the comment earlier in the code above here that says the tag table must start at zero. All of that combined with the fact that each one of the elements in the tag table is exactly eight bits long, seven through zero up here, means that the slot number is the exact same as the address of the entry in the table for any given slot. Okay, so skipping the debug stuff you can play with on your own. Therefore, I can just go into memory at the address in the HL register, which is the slot number, grab out the one byte in there. Now I store it in H temporarily because I got to use the accumulator to put the, uh, the the bank number back to what it was before by rereading the, the, the copy that we keep of the current, uh, what was the, uh, uh, the, the current value for the output, uh, the GPIO output port, okay? When we're done with that, we can put the H register into the accumulator and go on our merry way. So this subroutine says, give me a slot, given a slot number, I will give you the value of the tag that is represented by that slot number. And by the way, I'm gonna wreck H in the process. I gotta do something. Uh, I got a comment on the t on this here that reminds us that when this bank is messed around with, like I talked about before, you got to be very careful where the stack is because you might have pulled the rug out from under your feet because I'm using the stack to do this. And I remind us all that, FYI, this is actually okay because, I say the BIOS, but more accurately, this function here, which is local to this file, is only called in the read in someday of the right routines, 
uh, after it has switched the stack to a local private copy, which is in the high memory area. Okay, so this debugging code can work as is, in spite of the fact that I want to uh, enforce the rule that you're not supposed to interact with a stack in this code. Okay, when this is all said and done, at some point, uh, this code may have to be called and used without any concern to where the stack currently is. And I understand <laughs> it could get very confusing that we're actually going to use this return statement here. That's okay, because remember, we're playing with the games here. We're changing the bank. We're going to do what we want to, and then we're going to change it back. So regardless of what bank is in use and where the stack is, by the time we get down here, it is returned to the state that it was when whoever called this routine called it in the first place. By definition, that's okay. All right? So that's what this particular function does. Given a slot number, give me the value of the tag from the tag table. This routine down here says, giving a slot number, tell me what track is in the slot in our cache. And we do that by sending the slot number in the HL register pair. Again, I note that the H will be zero when this is called. When we return, HL will be set to the track number that is currently in our cache slot. In this cache slot, I should say. And if there's nothing in that slot, it'll set HL to all ones, which we know is an illegal value for a track number, so it doesn't cause any confusion, because all track numbers go from, you know, hex 0000, 0, 0, 0 to 3FF, uh, and this is greater than that. Therefore, this is going to be perfectly okay. Again, see the above IRQ warnings in this routine because this calls that routine in order to do its job. Uh, what does this thing do? It converts HL from the slot to the tag value. Actually, it sets A to the tag value. We just looked at that. Uh, then when it's done with that, what does it do? Uh, what I want to do is ask if it's invalid or not. And because of the way this is set up, it turns out it's in the most significant bit. I can just simply OR A with itself and find out from the flag after this is done uh, if the most significant bit is set. That would be considered the sign bit and the OR operation. And I can say jump if the value is minus or negative, right? Uh, if that bit was set. So this is kind of hard-coded to assume that the bit here that I'm going to check is actually the most significant bit. I don't know why I bother to optimize this at this point in the code design, but this is what you would normally do. You wouldn't waste a two-byte instruction to end in an immediate value uh, when all you want to do is ask if the most significant bit is set. And that's, again, one of the reasons I put the invalid bit all the way over on the left here, okay? Uh, you. this is what you would normally take into account when you design data structures like this during that era. You would not <laughs> make this any harder than it needs to be. Uh, you'd want to minimize all the uh, number of bytes for all the instructions, and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So this is the kind of code you'd, you'd normally see. Uh, I left that comment in there because this means this, provided that this bit is the most significant bit above. I should probably add a comment uh, to the equate above that says it must be the most significant bit, don't change it. Otherwise, you know, code will break, like I did with the other comment above as well. So what's the point here? If the most significant bit is set, it is invalid. Even though I call it the V bit, I wanted a one-letter name for that bit. And V makes more sense than I to me for whatever reason, even though that kind of violates my... Inverse uh, law, blah, 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 blah. I lose sleep at night over these things, by the way. So uh, I, I do give it some thought. But V is the way to go. Why? Because I is used for other bits. It's used over here. And I didn't want to skip over I here and then use it. Ah, like I said, I put too much thought into this. But that's, you know, call me out on it if you want. But that's, what's the, that's why it's the way it is. Okay?
So if it is set, it's invalid, and I go down here, and I set the return value to all ones to match the doc so we can recognize it. Otherwise, what do I do? I and it with the cache tag track value, which I technically don't need to do that at all, uh, right? It should be zero here anyway. I could comment this out, in other words, it make no difference. When I'm done with that, I put it in the H register because that's what this uh, code says it'll do. It'll return what? HL equals the track number. So what about the L, right? Well, remember, if HL is the slot address or the slot number as a whole, we know that H is zero upon entry of this function. And L is the slot number. Remember down here, what the, what's the slot number? Well, the slot number is also equal to the least significant 8 bits of the ultimate track number that must be in that slot. In a direct map cache, the only thing that can be changed is the upper byte of the track number. Therefore, if you give me a slot number and ask me what the track number is, which is the whole point of this function, I'm going to give you the slot number back and the least significant eight bits because that must be the least significant bits of the track number. Just don't touch them. Leave them alone. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into the tag uh, uh, table and figure out and restore what the bits are here so that I can do the opposite of this. I can take these bits and stick them back up here and return the track number. And we know that A and B are always zero, so I don't even care about that. So when I end this with a 3F, it guarantees these two bits are zero, which they are anyway, because I already checked to see if the most significant bit was set up here anyway. This bit is always zero because it's unused. Therefore, all I really need to do is take these bits over here, stick them back in there, combined with this slot number here, and I got the track back, all right? So given a slot number, what track is in there right now? If it's not valid, give me all ones, okay? So one more routine here is the ability to set the tag. So if I have a slot number and I put that in the L register, I can call this routine and say put the tag value that's in the H register into the tag table, please. And the way this works is I again have to select the, uh, the tag bank. We already went through that, okay? Again, don't mess with the stack here unless you're sure it's above, you know, the halfway mark, the high half of the memory, which it is because the way the rest of the code in this file works, okay? I have the uh, tag in H and the slot number in L. Well, if the tag number is H and the slot number is L, technically what I actually have is this okay so if the slot number is in l it's already right where i want it over here okay if the tag number is in h and i tag it out of the h register because i'm thinking of this being the hl pair right now right store that off to the side set h to zero then hl will equal exactly this which, as you know, is the address of the of the uh, of the tag, the tag table, and then I can take what I stored off into A and saved, and just poke it in the table. Well, where's the table? Well, once I set H to zero, it's at address H L because this now is the address in the slot table, or the, rather the tag table, where I want to store that tag, and that's exactly what I do here. <laughs> Three instructions takes care of it once the right bank has been selected. When I'm done, I can do some debugging and dump out the table and make sure it worked right and everything else. Restore the bank to what it was and go on our merry way. Again, be careful about interrupts if you're going to play around with them and call these routines. So how then do we use these new routines? Well, the first thing we know is what? I have all the old debug code we looked at last time still in here. Then I added some more debug code right here so not only do we're going to check the mapping logic that we went over and talked about last time above we're going to 
also look at our ability to manage the slot numbers in the tag table for real and to make sure that we're updating the right memory and the right banks and all this other fun stuff before we go too hog wild on this because anything could go awry in here. We really need to make sure everything's perfect, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, very disorienting things can happen. As I mentioned last time, we don't have any kind of a debugger uh, in this scenario. We're just diving in here, okay? So you have to be very careful. Uh, you could obviously run this on a simulator these days, or if you have a logic analyzer, you can watch the whole thing go, but I don't want to deal with either of those. We just have to be real careful and test the thing to death. Run it to death, test it like crazy, and you'll be able to you know, evolve this uh, without all those other uh, newfangled tools that are now you know 30 years old. But, you know, hey, this is retro time. We can't possibly afford such things. So what additional stuff am I going to print out? I'm going to print out the tag number for the track that um, I uh, want to read. Okay. And what am I going to do? I'm gonna, you can see I'm calling the, the, the new routine right there. I'm going to go track to slot, the easy thing. We just uh, throw a zero into H to do that. And then I'm going to say slot to tag. And I can then print out the, uh, the tag number that comes back in the accumulator. After that, I'm going to say, what is the, what, the current track number that's in the slot? This isn't the track I want to read. This is the track number that is already in our cache. So we're going to use this logic flow when we're doing our actual read. We're going to say, hey, give me the slot. Give me the track number that's in the cache right now. Then we can ask, hey, is this the one I want or not? Okay, so I'm going to dump this out and debug it right there before I blindly assume it's okay. And uh, then what am I going to do? I'm going to say, hey. I'm going to say, did I hit, all right? You, you talk about cash hits. Is the thing I want in the cash or not, okay? So the hit will be yes or no, depending on whether the track number matches the one we want. And how are we going to do with that? Well, I'm going to go in and save the one that we returned above into DE. Then I'm going to reread the one I want, and I'm going to subtract them, okay? I have to use subtract with carry because there's not a subtract, a 16-bit subtract without the carry. So I got to clear the carry. One way to do that is or the accumulator with itself. doesn't change the accumulator. It just zeroes out the carry flag. It's, it's actually by design. It's a feature uh, probably intended for this exact purpose. Uh, then I can subtract these two. And if I got zero, then they're equal. If they're not zero, then I missed it's a cash miss instead of a hit. And I'm going to say no. If they are equal, I'm going to say yes. Then I'm going to go down here and say, okay, carry on. When I'm done with all the above, I'm going to print out the new value of the tag that would go into the tag table if it was a cash miss. Okay. If it's a hit, I'm still going to print it out anyway. But um, in, it, when it's a hit, the new tag will equal the old tag value anyway. Though so this is just some extra debugging. Just for sanity checking as we go. And then I'm going to print an end of a line. And then I'm going to fall through down here into the main code that actually does all the reading and, and, and all that fun stuff and puts it in the various slots and all that. And I can see on the clock on the wall that we're running out of time. So next time we'll pick up here. Okay. But right now what we can do, I can show you what the debug looks like. If you want to work ahead, go back up over to our file system here, make world over there, and then do your make burn and spell it right. We put the card back in our retro board, press the reset button, and we see all kinds of debug spew. First thing I want to do is make sure I got the right thing. Did I did I run what I thought I ran? Okay, so here's the it booty up. Uh, debug is on. We got the DM cache enabled in the retro.asm file. You got to make sure the right include is in there, okay? And is that the current time? I'm going on 4 o'clock on the 7th. Yes, it is. I very often uh, <laughs> will forget to do a make or I'll load the wrong SD card or whatever. <laughs> Trust me, you don't want to waste a lot of time debugging the wrong code, okay? So I usually try to double-check this every time I boot. <laughs> Just saying, uh, uh, I hear it can get bad. <laughs> yeah, 
the neighbor's kids learn all kinds of new words from me when that happens after an hour of foolishness. Okay, so we talked about the uh, the cash in it routine before. And then we also talked about the fact that when you boot up CPM or you warm boot it, what it does is it reads the entire directory in, which starts in our design on track number 20 and goes all the way up to 3F. It reads in every sector one at a time in order. On, in this case, disk A, we only have one partition and one disk, one logical disk in this design. Uh, so we will always see disk zero, and you'll see the track go from 20, and then down here it'll go like 21, and so on, uh, and as it goes, right? And while the tracks are scanning, we read four sectors per track, zero, one, two, three, and then it goes to track 21, and goes back to sector zero, one, two, three, okay? Just to remember how this scanning works. And this is what the what CPM does, all right? This isn't code we wrote. This is just how this system boots. So, and the debugging code that we just looked at, right? So that's what's printing all this stuff up out here, right? We just booted it up, and the uh, init logic... I probably should have actually talked about that. Uh, if I didn't do that last time, I don't recall. Let's take a look at that really quick. Even if it, we need a reminder, because I need a reminder. <laughs> All right, here's the init routine. What the init routine does is it selects the RAM bank for the tag, uh, the bank that has the tag uh, table in it, right? And again, be careful about your stack, because it could be called in a wiki time. And we don't really know where it is at this point because it's called directly in the BIOS. So I just simply don't use the stack. Uh, and I do an LDIR, and I talked about how that works before. We just simply set every one of them to an invalid value. Now, I commented this out on purpose because tag inval, as you know, is a one followed by seven zeros. And in hex, that's an eight zero. And as we'll see some of the debugging output, what happens is if I print out a dump of the entire tag table, and that's what happens if you press the escape key, we'll look at that maybe next time. What, 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 what happens is you end up with all these eight zeros in the tag table. And visually, that's hard to see the difference between an eight zero and a zero zero, which I found very annoying. So... I happen to know that all ones is also invalid. Well, FF is definitely different than a zero, and all the, it's much easier to recognize the difference between an FF and something that's not an FF than it is to see an eight zero versus other thing. I, I'm just saying. That's actually why this is the way it is. Um, and then we restore the bank, go on our merry way. So this initializes our tag table. In that startup logic we talked about before. That's why all the tags are FF at this time, okay? Now, recall also that we just cold booted. We did not warm boot. So the way that the operating system got loaded was that the flash boot code loaded it in to this range, and then it blindly jumped to C000. We talked about that before. Now, why am I making this point and shoving it in our face? Well, I am because. In a warm boot, the BIOS would have read in all of the CCP and the BDOS, and we would have seen all that debug output coming in here if that was being done. But it's not. The first line of debug is it's scanning the directory. Okay? So make sure. That I got a lot of balls in the air here, I admit, but I want to make sure we all understand what's going on. So this is the first time. Anyone ever called the direct map read routine in the files that we just looked at? So this is the debug that comes out that we're just looking at. Fine. So it says, I want to read track 20, sector 0. And I want it to be put into here. That's the address of the directory uh, buffer in the BIOS that is part of the, uh, you know, the, the disk parameter header and the disk parameter block and all that stuff we talked about before. So what does that mean? It says, I want to get the uh, the data for this sector out of the track that must be in slot number 20, because we know that the, the slot number is the least significant 8 bits of the track. We saw all this stuff here last time. So given all this, what do we have in our cache at this time? Well, we can go and look in the tag table. It's been never used. That's why it's an FF in here. 
We know that the va invalid bit, <laughs> I should say, is set to 1. Therefore, the track must be invalid. Therefore, all the logic that we wrote up before must obviously be perfect, because it works in this one simple case. Aha! And uh, we know that an invalid tag means that the, the routine that returns a track number will return that if and when it's invalid. So, so far, so good. We know that we want to read in and data. We want to access data from uh, slot number 20 because we want it from track number 20. And we want to ask, is this track here the one I want? Well, that's the one I want. That's the what, it, what, what I got. No, that's not what I want. Therefore, we have what we call a cache miss. In other words, no, it's not a hit. And we also know that the new tag that we want to make it, put in that cache is part of reading in. Oh, you have to go out and actually get it from the SD card. I can't, you know, reuse an old track that happens to already be there. Uh, in order to do that, I need to set the tag to zero and read in track 20 into slot number 20 over here. Okay. Now, I didn't look at the code yet, but here's the debugging. If you want to work ahead on your own, I'm going to commit all this to GitHub. We'll talk about the rest of this next time. Um, we know that the bank that we want to read from, and this is kind of maybe poorly printed, th this is the value that needs to be written into the GPIO outlatch. So it's in slot number zero, in other words. And these bits here are the bits that are already in that latch that are not supposed to be changed. So this is after we've done that logic we looked at before, where you take the accumulator, and we get this value here from the slot number, okay? And then we play that game, we say, take the, the low significant four bits that are already in the GPIO output latch and combine them with these two bits here, okay? That's what's getting printed out here when you see this 0F. So it says, this is what I want to put in that latch so that I can access bank number zero. And then uh, here's the uh, other code that actually does the reading logic that reminds us that we have a miss on the cache from drive A, track 20, sector zero, while copying it into this address here. It's a little redundant, but that's okay. Better too much debug than not enough. And it prints out a reminder that the uh, cache slot address is 4000. Okay, which is the same thing we printed out up there. And what do we got? It says, I'm going to update the tag to zero for slot number 20 because I'm actually going to go out and read from the disk because I have a cache miss. I'm going to throw away what's in there, which is fine because right now it's invalid anyway. But even if it was valid, I'm going to throw it away and I'm going to read the new one in over the old one and I'm going to update my tape table accordingly. Now, at this point in the code, I'm not sure if that D is correct or not. Uh, it may have been left that way in the SD routine or the SPI routine, right? So um, be careful about that. But I believe what we're looking at down here is I want to copy from bank zero at this point, okay? Because we know that uh, the, the data for slot 20 we talked about last time must go into bank zero. The slot number 20 we know is in bank zero. And uh, so what this is really doing is saying, I want to copy from bank zero from address 4000, which is where uh, sector zero of track 20 is. We talked about that last time as well. In our cache, and we want to put it into where the BDOS said, which is this value there. It'll do an LDIR copy. We'll look at the code next time. And when it's all done, I want to put the bank back to where it was originally, which it says was EF. The reason it's EF is because E, remember, is 14. So it makes perfect sense that when we're done with the read routine, when it's cleaning things up, it's probably going to set the bank back to 14 because it's going to return back to CPM. And CPM, uh, remember, wants the memory to look like this, where bank 14 is in the bottom half and bank uh, 15 is in the top half. So it makes sense that it'll set the, the latch back to E, which is 14 for that thing there. Okay. So there it is, reading one in, it did a cache miss. And this debug will make more sense when we look at the rest of the code next time. Goes back to BDOS, says, okay, I want to read the next sector in track 20. Well, up here we read in track 20 with a cache miss. And when we come back again, I want the next sector 
that happens to be on the same track. This time it goes through all the same routines and logic, but it doesn't have to read it in, okay? Because it still wants slot 20, because track 20 is in slot 20. And this time the tag is zero, because it was set to zero up here when it read in slot 20. And it knows that the current track in the tag table, doing that reverse translation, should be track 20. We then compare this 20 to the one we want. We say we got what we want. We have a cache hit. And this is just superfluous at this point because we already got what we want. Now it moves on its merry way, copies the data into the target address here. Okay. The data has to be copied from bank zero. This time the sector address is 4080, even though the slot starts at 4,000. That makes perfect sense. Each sector is 80 in hex bytes long. If I want track 20 sector one, it would come 80 bytes after track 20 sector zero. We're still running it into the same target buffer because that's what the BDOS asked for. When we're done, we set the bank back to 14. This is gonna go over and over and over and over and over again as we go. All 32 of the sectors, one at a time, will be read in. Every time we read in sector zero, we'll notice that the same thing that happened when we had only one single buffer we talked about last time. Uh, each one of these first sectors of each track will actually show up as a cache miss because it's the first time anybody's ever accessed them. And because they're actually going in order, What'll happen is the slots will go 20, 21, 22, 23, and so on, all the way up to 3F. And they'll be read in one at a time into our cache. And none of them will replace any existing ones, just due to the simple order in which the things happen to be laid out. Okay? So that's just a coincidence at this point. And it's also something that I kind of had in mind when I said, well, we'll use a direct map cache, because CPM is going to do this uh, notion where it's reading things kind of in order anyway especially when it's doing a warm boot and when it's doing a directory scan, which is the sort of thing it does fairly often when you're doing an interactive bunch of programs and stuff like that. So uh, it's going to have a lot of it. It'll have the whole directory sitting in its cache when it's done scanning this. So if it wants to go back and re read anything, it doesn't have to go back to the SD card for any of the uh, 32 uh, sectors that are in there. Uh, anyway, so as it goes along, you'll see that, uh, you know, these address will go up by uh, 512 bytes in decimal each time, which is a hex 200. We talked about that last time. You go from 4A and then to 4C and then so on as it goes along. And uh, the first time it goes into any new slot, it'll not be there. It's a cache miss. It reads it in. And then it goes on its merry way and it says, okay, now I want sectors one, two, and three from the same slot. And we got a hit and a hit and a hit, just like we did before. But the benefit here is that all of the uh, slots, all the sectors of the directory are all in our cache by the time the scanning is done, instead of just the last one only. So we can hold 256 uh, SD blocks, which is the same thing as a uh, CPM track in terms of size and everything else, all in our cache at the same time. And right now we only need 32, and that's what all this stuff is doing. So it goes all the way up to the end, and as you know, the last one would be on track 3F, sector 3, and they would all have been read in. And you can see what, there's the last one, it's at address 7E00, we saw that last time, track 3F, and uh, we got all the stuff in there, okay? Now, with debugging turned on, if I do a directory, what will happen at this point, it's going to spew like crazy. That's why I left a big gap so we can find it again. But, it doesn't ever have to actually touch the SD card to satisfy this at this point in time. It will, um, yeah return instantaneously, <laughs> okay? Uh, let's go back at the top and look at see what happens here. If I wanna list the directory, what does it need to do? It needs to go back and reread the parts of the directory that actually have data in it that it remembers because it scanned through it the first time. That's one of the things, what reason it does that, right? So what does it do? It says, okay, give me the uh, first sector on the first uh, directory track again, and it's still in our cache, so we got a hit. 
It doesn't have to access the SD card. We're running, you know, a million miles an hour now. It grabs just that one little sector out, puts it where it wants to go, and it's fine. There's the four directory entries that happens to be on that sector, and it prints out, hey, there's these files that are stored in that sector in the directory. Then it goes on and reads the next one, right? This zero, what have we got now? Track, uh, uh, this thing scrolls off the screen here. Actually, this is very um, confusing because this terminal does not do line wrapping. What this is really doing is it's just printing all the characters over each other at the end of the line here. That's annoying. I apologize. So uh, what we could do, let's do an A, control A, X. Oops, that's not right. No, please. Uh, control A, Z. I'm in Minicom. And I, honestly, I can't stand it when line wrap is off. So I got to turn this thing on and hit W like this. And let's go ahead and do another directory. This time we'll be able to see it better. Oops. <laughs> If you print it, type it in right, D-I-R, and hit enter. Okay, go back to our little dirt comment. Where is it? There it is. Okay, so here's here it is with line wrapping turned on, so we can see what the heck we're looking at. This is the nine that we saw that confused us last time. All right, so what does it do? It reads in the first sector uh, from that address on track 20. It's sector number zero. Then the next one is going to come along and say, hey, I want sector number one. And this is printed all messy because it didn't print the character return before it started printing out the debugging. But that's just the nature of debugging in the middle of a, uh, of a driver uh, because that's where the cursor is when that gets called. Um, uh, so it comes along and says, hey, I already have that one course it does <laughs> it already had it up here too uh and it goes on its merry way every single one of these hit yes hit yes hit yes hit yes every one of these directory entries comes right out of our cache now okay so we're running faster which is great and this will continue to apply even if we access files on here when you run adventure for example the database for adventure will slowly start filling into our cache and the whole game will go faster if you run the same program over and over and over again, if the things are aligned right, the whole source, the, the binary image of that program will also sit in the cache. And once it's read in the first time, it'll just keep on reusing it out of the cache. Everything will go much faster. And that's the whole point of having a cache in the first place, right? So next time we'll pick up from here and look at the rest of the code that prints out the rest of this debugging and is actually doing the disk reading, all right? So all the code is in here for the disk reading. And it does work. And the debug, if we want to, I can show you that right now. Remember, if I press the escape key, the uh, console I.O. routine will call this, this this debug handler, which dumps out our entire tag table, by the way. And it makes perfect sense. This is why I put in the FFs, by the way, because I can now see all these zeros in here. The reason these are zeros is because the track number the only I.O. we've done so far is all from track numbers that start with 0, 0, and end with, you know, something, something. Specifically, 0, 0, 2, 0 through 0, 0, 3, F, okay? And that's exactly this. When we scan through the entire directory, we read in uh, several blocks from tracks, all that started with double zeros and ended with the 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, 2. Two, three, and these are all the tags. They're valid because the most significant bit's zero. These are all invalid because the most significant bits are one, and it's really easy to see because it's FF versus something else. So this is exactly what should be in the tag table right now. This is exactly what should be in all the other blocks, our slots in our in our in our in our cache. And this is what should be in all the other slots in our tag table for all of the blocks that we never read, okay? So you can play around with this to your heart's content and turn on and off debugging. Uh, what is in the code that I'm going to commit for this video is the read routine, and I believe it's fully debugged. We'll have to maybe do some more testing uh, next time, uh, but it should work. Uh, and the write routine is still all commented out and returns errors, by the way. So this is obviously not ready for prime time, 
we've got to uh, actually implement the rest of the code. So, as always, thanks for watching. Super thanks for my patrons. Please give me a like if you enjoyed this video. If you got this far, I assume you did. Obviously, as you can hear any other YouTuber talking, the YouTube algorithm really uh, messes everything up for us if you don't click like and you don't throw in the occasional comment. Uh, they, they just do not uh, present your videos to anybody uh, if that's not happening. So I would uh, appreciate any level of support, a like, a comment, whatever. Uh, feel free to subscribe as well. That, that definitely helps as well. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.